Camelback Bible Church. If you're a guest with us this morning, whether in person or online, a special welcome to you this morning. At Camelback, we're about Jesus, community, and mission. Well, this past Saturday, uh, the men had a wonderful opportunity to gather and hear from Pastor Jim on what is God's vision for manhood. Pastor Jim led us through Genesis 1 and 2, and then we had a breakfast afterwards. Men of the congregation, I want to encourage you that this is an extremely important thing for us to be discussing. What is God's vision for manhood? We so often hear, and as we learned yesterday, that the media can portray things, music can portray things, movies and all sorts of other things might try and establish, well, what is a man? But God's word outlines that clearly for us, and so I want to encourage us for a few upcoming men's events. The first is on February 20th. One is that we get to serve, and so on February 20th, uh, we want to invite all of the men of our congregation and to also invite your dads, your sons, your grandsons to come for a service project. We also have on March 20th, the second men's breakfast, which will be diving into God's word even further to look at what does God call us to be as men of his family and at, here at Camelback. Well, as we are community, one of the things we want to look at as a community is studying God's word together. And so if you go on the Church Center app, there's several teleos classes for you to be involved in to study God's word. So I encourage us to go to the Church Center app and look at what classes might interest you and sign up for them. Teleos is to be made complete, and we at Camelback want to be made complete and in God's word. We recognize as well that this season Although we are looking forward to 2021, we're also looking back at Thanksgiving and Christmas and New Year's and the year 2020. And some in the body have lost loved ones. And so we recognize that and we want to provide ministry to you to care for you well. And so starting on February 2nd at 6.45 p.m. in room 209, just across the way on campus, we're going to start Grief Share. Uh, Mardette is going to be leading that, and it's just a biblical way of how do we look at healing. It's a way to do it both in community and in God's word. Well, this morning, as we prepare our hearts and our minds for worship, let's pray before we read our call to worship. Holy and Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can worship you this morning, that we can gather together as your people to raise our voices to you. Father, we pray that we are coming out of a busy week and often looking to tomorrow for yet another busy week. But Father, you call us to Sabbath. And so Father, I pray that any distractions of this past week and this moment will vanish. Father, I pray that our hearts and minds are fully aligned on you this morning and Father that there are no distractions so that we can worship you well. Strengthen us and be with us this morning and it's in Jesus name we pray. Amen. Well Psalm 145 is one of David's last psalms and starts a cascade of praise in the psalms. Here David has so many rich words for praising God. He calls us to extol him to tell how great the Lord is. He calls us to praise him, to give glory to God, do his name. And he calls us to bless him, to speak of God's generosity. And so this morning, let us do just that as we read Psalm 145. David says, I will extol you, my God and King. I will bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. So this morning, let's do just that. Let's stand and worship our great God.
The psalmist says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man. For he satisfies the longing soul, and the hungry soul he fills with good things. Lord, we thank you and praise you this morning because indeed you have filled our soul with good things. You are the giver of every good and perfect gift. You see our every need. You hear our every prayer. You are watchful over your children. You love us. You have redeemed us when we were far away from you. You brought us home and bought us back. Lord, you have opened our eyes from blindness. You have raised our limbs from lameness. You've given life to our dead hearts. And so we thank you and we praise you with all of our hearts with all that we are today. Amen. Let's stand together and affirm our faith through the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. come to our Lord in confession. Lord, this morning we confess to you our unbelief, that we doubt you, that we question you. Lord, we doubt your love, that you truly care for us. We doubt your wisdom, that you know what we need, that you know what's best, that you know how to bless us. We doubt your power. We doubt that you're able to provide and to protect and to guide and to keep us safe, to answer our prayers. Lord, we confess to you our unbelief. And we recognize, Lord, that our unbelief, our doubting of who you are, has led us into deeper sin. We've taken matters into our own hands because we don't think you care or you're capable. So we have loved money and possessions because we don't think that you will provide or that you can keep us safe. 
We've lashed out at others with our words because we don't think that you are a God of justice and that we can trust our names, our reputations into your hands. Some have looked at pornography because they don't think that you know what's best for our sexual fulfillment. Some, Lord, have run away from you like Jonah, because they don't think your plans really are all that good. And so, Lord, in this moment, we confess our sins to you. These sins that grow from a root of unbelief. And we ask once again for forgiveness through Jesus Christ, our Lord. who died for sinners and rose again to give us life. And we say, Lord, with the father in Mark 9, the father whose son was demon-possessed, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. We pray all this in the name of Jesus, who loved us and gave himself for us. Amen. God's word says, I have been crucified with Christ, and it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And then not life, I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. This is God's promise to us. Let's come to God with our concerns and our prayers, our petitions. Lord, on this particular Sunday and in the weeks following our election, we recognize that we are coming to you during a major transition in our nation's life. 
And so we pray for peace in our land. We pray for a smooth transition of power. We pray for President-elect Biden and Vice President-elect Harris. We pray for Congress, the House and the Senate, members of the leadership, Speaker Pelosi, Majority Leader Schumer. We pray for our Supreme Court. And as we lift all these before you, we pray that you would give our leaders grace to govern with justice and with wisdom and integrity and for the common good of our people. Lord, we recognize that human governments are your grace to us and that the king is your servant, according to scripture, your minister. And so we know that you are vitally interested in good human governance and we pray that you would give that to us. As a nation, Lord, we pray for relief from the COVID pandemic. We pray this not only for our nation, but for the world. We thank you for the arrival of a vaccine or several vaccines. We pray for wisdom and skill for those who are distributing and administering the vaccines. We pray for healing especially for those that we have in our circle of relationships, for everyone, of course, but those who are closest to our hearts. And we pray that you would comfort those who have lost loved ones. Lord, we lift up our church family before you, and we thank you for a great men's breakfast yesterday. Thank you for a good start to teleos classes, Hybrids, some of them, some gathered in person, some participating online. The women with their studies, men and others. Thank you for, mem for our membership class and for those who are in that right now. Lord, for those who are new to the Kalmbach family, we pray that you'll help them to get woven into good friendships and deep relationships quickly so that we can grow together. Lord, we thank you for the arrival of little Priscilla Quayle, and we pray for Tucker and Chin Chin as parents. Pray, Lord, for all the expectant moms in our congregation and for uh, the families that you are building. We pray, Lord, that you will continue to give us a vision for church planting as we talk with other churches in the valley about how we can join hands and perhaps do this together. We pray, Lord, for our missionary family, for Francois and Valerie Picard, and for Jonathan and Elena Banegas in Spain, and Simon and Zira Makenga in Rwanda, John and Julie Lyles in Southeast Asia. And we're so thankful to have Doug and Rena Landro here with us this morning. So, Lord, we Pray all these things. Pray for our nation, our church, for ourselves. And we pray the prayer that you taught your disciples to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, this morning it's good to have Doug and Marina Landro here with us. I'm going to invite you guys up and uh, we get to get to know them. Many of you know Doug and Marina, of course, quite well. And so... Oh, they can, they can come up, they can say there, it's up to you, whatever you want. So. I was a missionary kid myself, and so I know what it's like. It's like, mom and dad are here, I gotta go up too. So. 
Well, it's, it's a, a great privilege to be here with our church family. Uh, you all know Marina, my wife, and my kids, Crystal and Vika, and our son Bogdan's in the U.S. Marines, so great. he's in Captain Pendleton. Uh, actually, he's on a way on some kind of a mission, but uh, uh, we're glad to be here this morning. Great. Good, good. And you guys are serving in Ukraine. Can you tell us a little bit about the ministry God's given you? Yeah, uh, so um, we bring people together to help the oppressed. That's kind of our mission. Uh, there's so much work to be done in our area that we can't do it by ourselves. And so uh, my position is actually a catalyst. And so I've gone in there and developed an alliance of churches, businesses, government agencies, educational institutions, individuals uh, who meet together uh, to help the oppressed. And the oppressed come in many different ways. There's the physical oppression, there's the social oppression, of course the spiritual oppression, which is the key. Every, in everything we do, we share the story of Jesus Christ with people. We're not ashamed of the gospel. And, uh, but Jesus did not separate mission from compassion, so we don't either. So we do meet the physical needs. An example of our alliance, so we get together and we look at, uh, for example, look at the Roma community. You guys call them gypsies here, uh, but the Roma uh, um, are very prevalent in our city. We have five squatter camps in our city, and they have myriads of problems. We're talking uh, very deep poverty in those, in those squatter camps. And so we begin to list all the problems in the community together as an alliance, and then we list the roots. What is causing those problems? Because we don't want to just help the symptoms, we want to go after the roots. Yeah. And I remember we listed all the uh, roots to these different problems, and there was one on there that made every list, it was never the top of the list, but it was this idea of the lack of self-worth. And almost everything that made the list, lack of self-worth. And so we began to think, well, what can we do to help the Roma develop self-worth? And one of the Roma leaders said, by serving others. Hmm. Oh, wow, that's an interesting concept. Give me, what do you mean by that? By serving, how does that help your self-worth? He says, well, when you help others, you feel good about yourself. Actually, you're no longer the low person on the totem pole. You're a giver. Yeah, because there's somebody who's worse off than you that you can help. And so we begin talking. We, we had uh, on our lines is the local television station. And they're saying, wow, we should be there with the cameras and as these Roma youth are serving the community because of the racism in our area. The Roma are considered, you know, just takers, takers, takers. They don't give. But we'll have the cameras there as the, the Roma are serving the impoverished Ukrainians, the Slavic people, the Hungarians who live there to bring down some of those racial barriers. Oops, I lost you there. Uh, ra racist barriers in that community. And so we thought, well, you know, we're going to take these Roma, we're going to train them to serve the community. And what are we going to have them do? Well, they're going to do construction, helping the poor fix the roofs and the walls and stuff. And then we thought, well, let's start a business. Let's start a home business, constructing homes, so we can also make some money so that the, the ministry is viable. It's self-supportive. And in that way, we're also giving jobs to the Roma as we train them. Thought, oh, hey, they need job skills. You know, because they, no, they don't have ways to, to get a job. And so we'll be teaching them construction job skills. So this, the whole, this one little project is just has so many different applications and how it's fulfilling. Plus, we're building tiny homes, which means we're providing um, affordable homes to the community who can't, you know, they can't afford homes at all. And uh, we're just really excited about how all these ideas come together when we come together. Uh, as, as the body of Christ and, and, and solve these issues. And um, briefly, I know I only have three minutes, but uh, one, of the, one of the projects we do is we visit the homes of the poor. We go in there and we share Jesus and we, and we pray over them. And, and tears come to their eyes because nobody comes to them and, and, and helps them. And very often we'll help them. One of the big things we do is we provide chickens. Uh, because 10, 10, uh, 10 hens and a rooster will provide their family with all the food they need for the eggs. And sometimes we'll give them uh, a goat uh, uh, to, for, to provide the milk. And so we're really happy about the ministry as we're helping people. And then these poor people who we give chickens to, they raise the chickens and they give chickens to other poor people. And it's kind of like a, we call it the chicken co-op. And it just kind of spreads as, as, and they're all excited because they can help somebody, their neighbor as well, because they have chickens as well. So we're really excited about this love of Jesus uh, going through the community. That's wonderful. Can we pray for you? We'd love that. 
Lord, we thank you so much for uh, Doug Marina and for their family and for the ministry that you've given them in Ukraine to see the worth of individual people as those who are created in your image who then are able to serve others and using that as a bridge for the gospel. Lord, we pray for wisdom as they strategize with other believers and come together to create these bridges of love for the gospel, to reach into communities uh, so that they'll be able to hear the good news of Jesus. And uh, we pray that you will bless them on this time that they're here in the U.S., go before them, give them uh, wonderful, uh, happy surprises um, as a family. And uh, we pray for their son who's in the Marines, that you would give him safety and grace uh, in every way. For it's in your name we pray, thanking you for our brother and sister and their family. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much.
Our scripture reading this morning is from Matthew chapter 6, as we're continuing on in the Sermon on the Mount. And we'll be looking at verses 19 through 24. Matthew 6, 19 through 24. Jesus says this, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body, so if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Lord, we hear your word, and we ask that your Holy Spirit will open our eyes to see and open our ears to hear, open our minds to understand, open our hearts to believe. Amen. Well, one day a wealthy man visited his rabbi and said, Rabbi, I can buy anything I want, but I'm not happy. What's wrong? So the rabbi took the man by the hand and led him to the window and said, what do you see? And he looked out and he saw the scene in front of him and he said, I see a blue sky with some clouds. I see a street full of men, women, and children. And then the rabbi took the wealthy man by the hand and led him to a mirror. And he said, now what do you see? I see myself. Then the rabbi said, my friend, there's glass in the window and there's glass in the mirror. But the glass in the mirror is covered with silver. Add a little silver and you don't see others, you see only yourself. Money promises happiness, but in fact, wealth and possessions can easily turn us in on ourselves and make us miserable, make us blind to God and to others. And that's a tale that's been so often told and a story we know too well. Well, in the first half of this chapter, we learned that living in God's presence, or as we've been using that Latin phrase, living coram Deo, before the face of God, that transforms our spiritual disciplines. And we looked at uh, giving and praying and fasting. And now in the second part of the chapter, Jesus teaches that living coram Deo changes the way we look at our wealth and possessions. And it changes it because we know we have a Father in heaven. He loves us. He sees us. He cares for us. He's watching out for us. He's leading us home. We're conscious of his presence. And this fundamentally changes the place and the power of money in a Christian's life. We're not looking to our finances for security or satisfaction or significance. Why not? We have a Father in heaven. We have joy that money can't give. We have true wealth that doesn't rise and fall with the markets. We have a Father who spares no expense caring for his children. Our Father protects us. Others have to pile up walls of protection for a false sense of security, but we know that God himself is watching over us. We are living coram Deo. As I was thinking about this, my mind went back to those verses that we 
looked at in 1 Peter last year, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3-5, through 5, and listen to them again. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation that's ready to be revealed in the last time. If we know God this way, that fundamentally changes the place and the power of possessions. Now, we live in an affluent area and our church is located in one of the wealthiest zip codes in the nation. That's simply a fact. So this is a message that we need to hear. The Bible doesn't condemn money in itself. We see examples in scripture of godly people who handle their wealth rightly. Abraham was a rich man, as were Job and David and Joseph of Arimathea. Lydia was a prosperous businesswoman. And I can think of a number of people that I've met who have been very wealthy, who have used their wealth very, very well. They've owned their possessions. Their possessions didn't own them. Money itself is not the problem, and that's not what Jesus is saying. The problem is how we think about wealth and possessions, what they mean to us, the place they have in our life. And that's why the Bible does say that wealth is highly dangerous. It's seductive. It's easy, instead of living coram deo, to live coram dollar, to love money more than God. And that's why the scriptures warn us in 1 Timothy 6, the love of money, not money itself, but the love of it, is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. And so the scriptures also contain examples of men and women who ruined their lives because they loved wealth. Achan, in the Old Testament, brought ruin on all of Israel. Solomon's heart was turned by wealth and women. Gehazi was struck with leprosy. Ananias and Sapphira died because they lied about money. Demas loved this world. The church in Laodicea loved riches. So in Matthew 6, 19 through 24, Jesus teaches us to live coram deo with our wealth. God's presence keeps our possessions in perspective. And so he teaches us to have the right treasure, the right eyes, and the right master. The right treasure, the right eyes, and the right master. So that we can live coram deo with our wealth. So the right treasure... Jesus starts with a warning in verse 19. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. Proverbial words. And Jesus is warning us against the futility of gathering and grasping things on earth. And he gives us two reasons not to count on our earthly possessions. For one thing, we're gathering them on earth. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. Why does that matter? The heart of Jesus' preaching was that the kingdom of heaven had come. A new age had begun. The king had arrived in this world. God was establishing his new reign through Jesus. The kingdom had broken into this world. 
And so Jesus' coming was proof that mere treasures on earth would soon be worthless. A new age had dawned. How foolish to store up treasures that will soon have no currency. If you like Tabasco sauce, you may not know the story of the man who invented Tabasco sauce. In 1841, Edmund McElhaney moved from Maryland to New Orleans, which was the third largest city in the United States at that time, and he was determined to earn a fortune in banking, and he did just that. He started as a bookkeeper, but by 1857, he owned five banks in Louisiana and had married into a prominent family. Well, if you're thinking about the timeline, you realize that's right before the Civil War came. And during the Civil War, McElhaney became fabulously rich, supplying the Confederacy with salt from his property on Avery Island. And by the time the war ended, McElhaney had a mountain of cash. But here's the problem. It was all in Confederate bills. And so the fortune he gathered over 25 years of work and ambition was worthless overnight. And that's why he invented and marketed Tabasco sauce to support his family. But he never regained the fortune that he lost when the Confederacy collapsed. Laying up treasure on earth is like hoarding Confederate bills. It might look impressive But when the war is over, when the new kingdom's here, it has no value. The kingdom of heaven has come, and earthly money, treasure laid up on earth, will soon be worthless. And not only are treasures on earth worthless in eternity, they're not even safe now. And he talks about how Our earthly forms of wealth, like clothing and other forms, will be destroyed. Moths destroy the finest clothing. Rust will attack the nicest car. And if nature doesn't devour our valuables, thieves can steal things that are precious to us. And that's why the writer of Proverbs says, Do not toil to acquire wealth. Be discerning enough to desist. When your eyes light on it, it is gone, for suddenly it sprouts wings, flying like an eagle toward heaven. I brought my daughter and her friend up to the Grand Canyon a couple weeks ago, and I was standing there on the edge just watching those birds just kind of go out over the edge. Have you ever just marveled when you've seen that? You thought to yourself, wouldn't it be great just to be able to soar like that? That's what our money does. If you watched your IRA or home value climb during one decade only only to plunge in a downturn, you've experienced the inherent insecurity of wealth. Termites or mold can ravage the nicest home. An illness can wipe out a family financially. Treasures on earth are not safe. We've been talking about money as treasures so far, but... Interestingly, this word treasures is broad enough to include anything that we value in this world. Treasures come in all shapes and sizes. It may not be finances. It may be a husband, a wife, or children that we are tempted to put before God. It may be your looks or your figure or your six-pack abs. Some love their work too much. Promotions and bonuses and hitting sales goals are treasure that gives them satisfaction and significance. For some, it's their home. It could be the the, the love of honor or of status or of authority. Some people aren't tempted by money, but the devil comes and tempts them with a leadership position. 
And without realizing it, soon they're more concerned with staying in control than they are with God's work and his honor. And status is their treasure. If anything in this world is everything to you, it's an earthly treasure. So we need to treasure the right things, the right treasure. Verse 20, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. Jesus wants us to be genuinely rich, but not with earthly things that are doomed to decay. He wants us to be wealthy with lasting treasure that will endure for eternity. Money and possessions and people's good opinions, these are flimsy, temporary. Jesus wants us to work for wealth that will satisfy you forever. Treasure in heaven is safe and it's eternal. It will never decay, can't be stolen. God himself is guarding our inheritance for us. So the question is, how do we store up these sorts of treasures? How do you do it? Well, as we've been reading through the Sermon on the Mount, we've heard Jesus promising rewards all the way through this sermon. He's been promising us treasure in heaven. Go back to the Beatitudes, Matthew chapter 5, verses 2 through 12. He promises us heaven, the kingdom of heaven. He promises us the earth. He promises us comfort and satisfaction. He promises us mercy. He promises that we will see God and we will be God's children. And he ends with these words. The Beatitudes, Matthew 5, 12. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. We lay up treasure in heaven by embracing the gospel so that we experience the Beatitudes. God rewards that kind of heart. Jesus promised a reward for those who keep his word. Matthew 5, 19, whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. An eternal reputation. And Jesus promises a reward for our spiritual disciplines when we do them for God alone, coram Deo. Three times in this chapter he's repeated that. Verse 4, verse 6, for eight, verse 18, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. That is how we store up treasure in heaven. We are conscious of God and his presence. We are serving him. As we go about our Christian lives. As Christians, we put all our eggs in one basket. We bank everything on our faithful Father and his reward. We say to ourselves, I cannot imagine what he has in store for me. This isn't in my notes, but turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2. There's a really cool passage I want to show you. Ephesians chapter 2. And pick up with me in verse 6. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6. Paul says, By grace you have been saved, and he raised us up with him, that is, with Christ, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages... The reason you've been saved now, the reason you've been seated in heaven now, is so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. In other words, everything that you've experienced of God and his goodness now is an appetizer 
to the grace and the riches that are to be yours in the coming ages. That's God's reward. So the question comes to us, where is the focus of your heart? The principle of verse 21 back in Matthew 6 is unyielding. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. If you're living for God's reward, if you're living for treasure in heaven, that's where your heart's going to be. We need the right treasure. We need the right eyes. That's our second main point. After teaching us to have the right treasure, Jesus teaches us to have the right eyes, to see clearly. Verse 22, the eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light, but if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. This is a little bit confusing. What does it mean? These verses are a little bit tricky, and there's some debate among Bible scholars here. My take is that Jesus is speaking to people in the 21st century, and his words are accommodated to their scientific outlook. And we call this sort of thing accommodated language, speaking in a way that fits the worldview and perspective of the hearers. And we do that all the time. For instance, when we talk about the sunrise, we don't literally mean that the sun is rising, turning around the earth. No, we understand that it's the earth that's turning. But from our perspective, the sun appears to be rising over the horizon in the morning. And so we call it a sunrise. That's accommodated language. And that's what's going on here. Jesus is accommodating himself to the worldview and perspective of his hearers. When we talk about the eye, we know scientifically that light enters in through the eye and through the lens and strikes photoreceptive cells on the retina. The eye detects light coming in from the outside, and that's called the intromission theory of sight. And it's been the standard understanding of sight since about, for the last 500 years, roughly. In the pre-modern world, though, many people believe that the eye emitted light to illuminate the world around us. And that's called the extramission theory of sight. And Jesus is speaking to people who understood sight in this ancient way. His words are accommodated to their pre-modern worldview. So he's talking about, from their perspective, how we see And so really, who he's talking about our hearts because who you are inside colors the way you see everything in your life. So what kind of eye, what kind of heart do you have? A healthy eye is literally a single eye. It's an eye with a single focus. A man with a healthy eye has a healthy heart. He looks at the world with one priority. He longs for God's glory. He's looking for God's reward. He's living coram Deo. But a bad eye means our hearts are full of darkness. If I look at the world with greedy eyes, it's because I have a greedy heart. If my eye automatically calculates the price tag of clothes or cars or a home, it's because I have a materialistic heart. If I look at others with a critical fault-finding eye, it's because I have a judgmental heart. And that leads to Jesus' final exclamation in this paragraph, if the light inside you is darkness, how great is the darkness? There is no greater darkness than the inner darkness of a heart that is far from God, a heart that doesn't see God, love God, hope in God, trust God. That life is full of darkness. But if our hearts love God and long for his kingdom and look for his reward, reward the world is full of light and we see our lives, our possessions, our treasure clearly. We need the right eye. And the right eye means the right heart. A heart that's focused on God, Coram Deo. Which brings us to the third main point, the right master. 
the right master. More specifically, Jesus is warning us against trying to serve God and our earthly goals at the same time. I remember when I was a freshman in college, my roommate and I were talking late one night, you know, we're lying in our bunk beds, you know those conversations that you kind of have in the dark. And he said, Jim, what I really want is to be enough of a Christian to go to heaven, but I also want to live my life and do the things that I want to do. I don't want to be so much of a Christian that it changes the things that I want. And I often think back to that. He was trying to serve two masters. He wanted the fire insurance of going to heaven, but he didn't really want God to change his life or have a claim on his priorities and the things he was really living for. But here's the thing, there is no dual citizenship in the kingdom of heaven. We are citizens of heaven living for our king or we are living for this world that is passing away. Verse 24, no one can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. This is about loyalty. At first glance, we might think that what Jesus is saying here isn't true. After all, many of us have held two jobs at one time or another, and in this economy, people cobble together two part-time jobs to get by while other people are moonlighting. It's demonstrably true that we can serve two employers. But Jesus is not talking about employment. He's talking about slavery. A slave wasn't employed under contract. He is owned by another person who has the right to his full efforts. And it's impossible to please two separate masters because they're each going to have their agenda. In the same way, a Christian can't have two loves, two masters, two deepest desires, two goals in life. It is impossible to live for earthly rewards and God's reward at the same time. Either you see that this world is passing and its treasure is all going to burn, or you don't. Like a car with two engines driving in different directions or two locomotives pulling against each other. You're motivated by a love for God and driven by a desire for his kingdom or you're building your own kingdom. If we're going to serve God as our master and not money and live coram deo and not coram dollar, we need to see the vastly superior blessings that God has for us. We need to know that we can trust him We need to know that he is good and he is able to do all the things that he's promised. And if we see that, then God will exert a greater control over us than money does. We know we have a father in heaven. He gives joy that money can't give. His wealth doesn't rise and fall with the markets. Our father provides for us. He spares no expense on our behalf. He protects us. We don't need to pile up a wall of possessions because God himself watches over us. Your father in heaven has committed himself to you for your good. He proved his love for us by giving us his son, Jesus Christ. If he's given us his son, is there any good thing that he will not give us now? in an eternity. Like a man looking through the glass, a little silver will blind us to this. But living in God's presence will change the way that we look at our lives and our possessions. May we live coram Deo in this world. Lord, we thank you for these challenging words for us about whom we are serving. And we thank you, Lord, 
that you have promised to provide for all of our needs out of your riches that are in Christ Jesus. You own the cattle on a thousand hills. There's nothing we have that you need, but instead you are the one who gives us life and breath and every good thing. And so we look to you, our Father. We lift our faces up into the light of your presence. And we hold all that we have with open hands, hoping and counting on your reward. Amen. to do immeasurably more than all that we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Go with God.